Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed our last uh, video lecture of uh, the African International System. Today, we are going to be talking about something a little different, uh, which I like to call the worlds of the Americas. You could say the American International System if you wanted. Um, before we begin, um, I don't really think there's any administrative uh, issues that we need to talk about. I think most of that was covered uh, last week. Uh, just to say, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. Though, of course, we'll be having a um, chat on Sunday, which I'm sure Eric told you about. Well, Eric did tell you about. I was in the email. Um, so you can uh, ask all the questions you want then. But if there's anything pressing or anything you'd like to discuss, again, you can email me uh, at any time. Okay. So today, as I said, we're going to be discussing what I like to call the, the world's of the Americas, okay? Uh, and we'll begin by talking about what's popularly known as the Aztec, okay? Um, I want to talk about their origins, uh, the early years of the Aztec world. I want to talk about the international, the international system that was in place there before uh, the Mexican people arrived, who are kind of credited with creating the Aztec Empire. Uh, I want to talk about the growth of the world under the, under the Mexica and the economic system that tied the world together. Okay? Then I want to shift to talk about the Incas. I want to focus on the role of the environment in that world, the origins of the Inca, their rise, and how they governed such a vast empire and how they managed to keep it so connected. And I want to conclude then by talking about um, religion and sacrifice in these two worlds, in the Aztec and the Inca worlds. Okay? And then I will... Um, I'll leave you to Eric, and you guys can discuss the lecture or do presentations or whatever it is that you guys um, have lined up. Okay, so we'll begin um, by talking a little bit about revisiting actually the idea of prehistory. Okay, and, and, and issues with sources in the American worlds uh, because the issues of sources. Uh, looms large in this in this in this uh, in this particular lecture and in this particular topic. Okay, um, there's there there's not a tremendous amount of documentation that were provided by the Aztec or Inca peoples themselves. Okay, what we have are, are, are various codex or codexes. Okay, that are from both pre-colonial times and colonial times. Okay, and these codexes are pictorial representations of key events in Aztec or Inca history. Okay, I mean, you should uh, have be, you should be familiar with the Codex Mendoza, which I wanted everybody to have a look at, because I think it's a really cool piece, and it's probably the most related to international relations of all the codexes. Um, and so you get an idea of kind of what pictures you're looking, what, what, what these pictures are telling, what stories they're telling, you know, tribute and kings and these kinds of things. Um, so this, this particular one was a, a post-colonial uh, codex uh, from the mid-1500s, all right? Um, the problem is, is many of the pre-colonial codexes uh, were destroyed uh, by conquistadors, priests, uh, you know, thinking they're heretic, heretic, heretics, uh, the, the, you know, that works needed to be destroyed. Um, however, um, there are quite a few good sources, good post-colonial sources uh, that that we can rely upon. You know, the post-colonial codex, and also just just some journals and, and, and travel logs um, that were very well researched by typically members of the church. Um, so these are reliable sources, and that's where I, I'm getting a lot of information from. And that's where historians get a lot of their information from as well. But of course. <clears throat> When you're using these sort of post-colonial and European sources, you have to be very, very careful of, of bias, of biases. Right? A lot of times in European works, um, you have uh, Europeans kind of uh, expressing very strong opinions on uh, heathenism, that um, you know the American people are barbarians, uh, you know, they need to be civilized, um, even and, and worse. Okay, so you need to be aware of the of that carefully with, the, with these sources. But you, what's interesting about the Aztec and the Inca sources, and particularly Inca, 
are that you have to be very careful of native bias. Okay, uh, when we go on to talk about the Inca, we'll talk more about the importance of kinship. Okay, and so in the sources, a lot of times you have a certain group of people um, basically bragging about what um, was done by people in their lineage. Okay, and they'll take credit for uh, uh, of, for conquering this land. All right, and whereas a different group of people will take credit for conquering the same land, their ancestors conquered the same land. So <clears throat> you end up with very, very conflicting uh, reports about um, who conquered what and when, right, and, and, and who did what, uh, in particular the Inca world. So this creates kind of a muddled picture of, of, of dates, time frames, which emperors did what. Okay, but it's also something that's very cool and very unique to the Americas, um, you know, and it makes it kind of a region and, and a peoples and a system that's kind of shrouded in mystery in a sense. It makes it very, very cool and a very interesting um, system or history and world um, to learn about. Okay, so those are some of the issues that we're up against today in terms of sources. Um, and so, uh, you know, I guess it's my job, um, in theory, to try to sort through this as much as possible. Okay, so... To do this um, uh, is what I'll do, is kind of provide a narrative, particularly with the, with the first case of the Aztec. I'll, I'll provide a narrative about the origins of the world and what life was like in the world uh, and those kinds of things. And uh, at the same time, I'll try to kind of uh, pull out key themes, which, uh, uh, you know, reveal what international relations was like um, at the time, okay, uh, what the international system was based upon, um, and also about just generalized key theories about the history of international relations. Um, you know, we, I lectured last week about Africa, um, and there are some parallels that we find in the Americas as well, which are very interesting, that may, you know, kind of speak to some universalities in international systems and in international relations that I would like to, to bring out at the sort of conclusion of this, of this lecture. Okay, so, let's begin... Um, with the discussion of the Mexico people. Um, the Mexico people are popularly called the Aztecs, okay? And the rise of the Aztec Empire uh, was explicitly linked with the development in, in the growth of the Mexico peoples, okay? So I'll kind of use the terms interchangeably here, but more precisely, I'm telling the story of the Mexico people, okay? So, similar to last week, um, the story of the Mexica begins in migration. Okay? So last, last week we talked about um, the importance of the Bantu migration in shaping Africa. Uh, remember groups moving from West Africa down into South Africa, down, West Africa down into South Africa. Um, this week uh, we, t we discuss a migration of the Mexica people from their former homeland of Az Aztlan, Okay, you have to forgive me with pronunciation on these terms, Aztlan, and down into the valley of Mexico. It's a long migration. It takes many years, okay? Um, and during that time, they kind of maintain their hierarchy, uh, perform sacrifices, uh, kept a sort of rudimentary governmental structure with, with priests on top dictating migration patterns and stuff like that. Um, but the issue is that no, nobody really knows where the, 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 the point of origin was, this Aztlan. There's um, some speculate that it might have been in California. Uh, others speculate that it is in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the southern United States. Um, some people even think that it might have been in the Valley of Mexico already, and it was a very small migration. Um, but nobody actually has, has proved this conclusively, and the sources are um, both conflicting on this, um, and, and uh, the, the native uh, histories are unclear. Um, <clears throat> What, it, what is clear, however, is that the Mexico were actually following people. Okay? You have the, uh, a, a group of Nahuatl-speaking people, um, and it, it's basically a long series of migrations of, of them. Okay? And the Mexico are kind of following suit. All right? They arrive um, in the Valley of Mexico around in the mid-13th century, um, uh, sometime around then. And what do they find? Well, interestingly enough, they find uh, an established, what's it really an established international system. Um, and this was one of the surprising things for me when uh, uh, 
uh, I started doing doing research on this uh, on this system a few years back is, is that there was an established international system in the Valley of Mexico at this time. Um, and basically what you have is a, a system of city-states, an expansive system of city-states. Um, they have similar customs, similar language, of course, because it was all the same uh, people migrating, the same, the same language, family of people migrating. Um, you have uh, similar histories, of course, similar ancestry. Um, and you have a large number of these city-states. Okay, So in 1519, um, the, the Spanish recorded that there were 50 city-states. So, you know, you're talking about a city-state system larger than um, the one uh, that is often cited in, in Italy, right? Uh, which, which I thought was quite interesting. So, these city-states are very small, of course, 50, 50 or more in the Valley of Mexico. Um, and they're, because they're so small, they're basically in constant uh, e economic, military, political, and, and, and social contact. Um, and it's a very balanced system. There's, there's of course, stronger, straight, stronger states and tributary states and vassal states and things like that. But for the most part, it's a very balanced system. Um, these, there was extensive trade between these city-states, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, later. Uh, they, they visited each other, visited one another for religious ceremonies, um, for king's funerals, for festivals. Um, <clears throat> intermarriage was very important. Okay, so a weaker state would often marry off, uh, the king of a weaker state would often marry off a daughter to um, a king of a, of a more powerful state. Um, and this is, you know, connects the states diplomatically, and it's also a kind of a being humble that you're you're the lower state kind of thing. Um, and all of this sort of made this a, a remarkably tight tight knit group of city states at this time in the mid 13th century. Politically speaking, uh, the the king was in charge of these city states. There was a king king in charge of the city states. Okay, there was a royal council as well, but the king had most power. He owned all the land. He controlled the military. He was kind of master of ceremonies at a lot of the, uh, a lot of the festivals. Okay, and all of this um, kind of reflects an extremely hierarchical society, which which characterized many of these city states. You have your king up top with the royal council. You have a noble class, um, and you have then your commoners. Okay, so it was a very hierarchical society, and nobles even were thought to be. Um, Selected to be nobles by uh, by the, by the gods, so you know you have this sort of ingrained idea of hierarchy. So, what about the Mexica in this world? Remember, we're talking largely about the Aztec world through the, expo uh, the, the the experience of the Mexica. So, what about the Mexica in this world? Well, when they arrived, there were latecomers into the system. Um, and because of this, they don't really get any, um, any respect, all right? So they're kind of low man in the system when they first get there in the mid-13th century, okay? To make things worse, um, they do not have anybody in their group who has relations to the Toltec Empire. Toltec Empire would, ruled the Valley of Mexico before uh, these city-states established there, and it was... Uh, it was it was necessary to have a king who was related to somebody in the Toltec Empire in some way, to the kings of the Toltec Empire in some way. And the Mexicans don't have this. So what this means is they are forced, essentially forced, to become a vassal state, become a tributary state to a larger state. Okay, And this is kind of how they get their foothold in this <clears throat> very hierarchical city-state system in first. So they join the Kolhua people, okay? So the Kolhua people, they say, okay, yeah, sure. They give them a piece of, uh, of land, a very invaluable land that was located in a swamp. Um, and they're, in exchange, they're expected to uh, fight uh, in, in, in whatever military conflicts pop up, things like this. And in doing so, they prove themselves to be great warriors and they gain a reputation for, the, for, for being great warriors. Now, uh, problems ensue this relationship, in this tributary relationship. Um, the, the, the story goes from, from the Aztec sources that um, their god, um, 
commanded them to sacrifice one of the Kohua princesses during a public ceremony. Okay. So they have the, 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 the aristocracy and the nobles and the, in, the, in the government figures from, of the Kohua people over and they sacrifice their princess. And of course this does not go over well at all. Uh, the result is they flee. Okay? They have to leave their swampland and the Mexica are basically on the run again. Um, rather quickly though, they reestablish with another uh, powerful state, <coughs> powerful city state in the area. Um, this was the Tepanic. Okay, the Tepanic people. Okay, um, so they establish relations with them, um, and through them, they're able to uh, uh, marry one of their nobles to somebody who claimed Toltec lineage. Okay, so this kind of means finally, at long last, they have their own king. Okay, so which was of course very important in the system to sort of have this have this marking. Now, problems again ensue in their relationship with the, with their uh, with their overlord state. Okay, the, te the Tepanic people. Now, the Tepanic pe people's king Tezozomac, okay, dies. All right, and this kind of creates a power vacuum in the Valley of Mexico because the Tepanic were the strongest state in in in, in the valley while while they were with the, with the uh, Mexico. So this kind of creates a power vacuum. Um, and what's worse is the Mexican people are unhappy with uh, the, the king who takes over. Okay, they think he's a usurper. Um, they think that their, their taxes, their duties have become too high. The military, the, what they expect the military to do is too taxing. Okay, and you get a separatist faction to that which develops. And the faction is led primarily by Montezuma. Uh, and you have extensive debate between Montezuma and his peers in the Royal Council, and ultimately the decision is to split. The decision is to split from the Tepanic. Okay? And they, the, the Mexican knew that this was going to be a huge problem um, because of the power of the Tepanic, so they immediately go uh, looking for allies, and they find them. Um, they find them, and they establish relations with the city of Texcoco and Tacloban. Okay? And this... With this, you have the emergence of the famous Triple Alliance. Okay, and quite remarkable what these states did. Actually, they 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 basically they agree to govern all the city states that they conquer as one. Okay, they agree not to wage war against one another, um, and they agree to divide uh, the spoils of war and whatever taxes come in amongst themselves. Okay, so the three of them they sort of split it 40, 40, 20. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure why. It wasn't even split, but 40, 40, 20, okay? And in doing this, they really cre they create a, a, an empire that spanned the entire Valley of Mexico and even, even beyond, okay? Now, how did that empire grow? Well, whenever there was a disloyal king or a king who was suspected of being disloyal, in one of the city states, he was quite simply removed, and somebody else was put up in his place. Okay, new administration, administrative positions were um, established in new city states and old city states that proved to be problematic. Um, so they can kind of uh, the, 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 the triple lines can kind of govern the states from within. You know, these were type of like advisory positions. Um, they collected taxes. Okay. Uh, they develop a universal legal code, uh, which featured some very strange laws, um, such as, you know, commoners could not have houses with two floors, things like this. And also religious temples were built in all the, all the new city-states, okay? They all sort of followed, the, all the city-states followed the same architectural blueprint, and any new state that was brought in had to follow that blueprint. So, through, and this way, they kind of... They're, they kind of solidify their control and make this system of city-states even uh, more sort of united and, 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 and more well-networked, you know, to just tie the noose a little bit tighter. Um, they also uh, were tied together with the, with, with the economic system. Okay? They have a very 
uh, an expansive system of markets, um, which is one of the most remarkable things about the Aztecs. Um, you know, you could buy anything at these at these markets, um, anything from dogs to construction materials, produce, meats. Um, you know, everything organized sort of aisle by aisle by aisle by aisle. You know, um, makes you think of kind of a shopping mall. Um, you know, the the largest market had some sixty thousand people buying and selling things, um, which is which is amazing to think about. Um, these markets as well, just like most of the Aztec world, were hierarchical. Okay, so you had you know your big markets in capital cities, and, and all the way down to your 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 uh, your less uh, frequent markets, um, where you're just sort of getting a small scale of change exchange of, of local local goods. Okay. And there was also a system of merchants. It was the merchants who were kind of responsible for uh, obtaining goods from abroad um, and then selling uh, goods uh, 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 once back. Um, because of their, uh, you know, they, they, they were the ones who were constantly leaving and coming back to the empire, they also acted as spies, which is rather interesting, okay? They, um, you know, would size up, uh, see if any... Enemy states from a distance were preparing for war. Uh, they would make a note of how of how capable or incapable their armies were, um, things like this, and they would report back to the to the kings um, in the Aztec world. So that um, this was kind of how they got their foreign intelligence uh, through these through these merchants. Okay. Um, interestingly, they also only really acted at night. One of the laws in the Aztec world was that people should not show their wealth. They wanted, you know, the king to be the wealthy one, so they would usually come in at night um, and sort of hide whatever goods they had, so that people weren't aware that other people, that people besides the king, were actually um, wealthy. Okay, so that's um, basically what I what I want to say about the Aztec world in, in the story of the the rise of the Mexica. I mean, I think that gives you um, a pretty good sense of what was going on there. Um, you know, it was it was a very it was a remarkably tight knit group uh, of city states. That were held together, you know, by a strong economy, by common language, by common traditions, by common ancestors. Um, these types of things. Um, now, what if we kind of break from that for a second? Um, you know, we're, we're starting to 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 um, learn a, a thing or two here about um, history of international relations more generally, right? Okay, so you know, reflecting back on uh, the Africa case and now, and now this case of, of, the, of the Mexican people, and, and I'm sure you've probably talked about this with Eric as well, you find uh, a, very, uh, a very significant, um, how should I say this? It, it's a very important aspect of, in the history of international relations is migration. Right, so we had tremendous importance in the in the African international system with the Bantu migrations, and now again with the Mexica. Okay, so I mean, what do these migrations do? Well, they really sort of bond people together and systems together over an extensive period, or over, over an extensive geographical area. Okay, it spreads tradition, it spreads ways of life, it spreads customs, it spreads culture, it spreads language. Okay, and all of this. Um, is absolutely vital to the existence of an international system or a world or whatever it is, an international society, whatever it is you want to call it exactly. Okay, so I think that's one thing to note, you know, the tremendous importance of migration. Also, we're seeing a tremendous importance of kinship, right? Uh, you know, the African system in large part was built uh, upon kinship, okay? And now with the Aztecs, we've seen the importance of the relation to the Toltec Empire. This is how they got their legitimacy. You know, you needed to, you, you absolutely needed to be of relation to the Toltec Empire to be a ruler, okay? Whether the relations were actual or whether they were mythical was a different matter. But, you know, there's that, that importance of kinship there um, that sort of structures some of these non-European international systems. Uh, you know, we've seen that in two cases now, and we'll see that again in the Inca. Um, so, you know, those are kind of two themes that sort of jump off the page at me in terms of uh, the history of international relations. Okay. And also, of course, the importance of language. You know, language is vital in a national system, but that again ties back to what we're talking about, migration, migration spreading language. Okay. So, um, we can proceed now um, to talk a little bit about the Inca. Okay. Um, I just 
want to go over their origins and their surroundings, their growth, and how they've basically um, consolidated their empire. Okay. So, um, we talked last week about the importance of environment in Africa, and you have to begin uh, your dis a discussion of the Inca with the, with the discussion of the environment again. Okay. The environment is, is, is absolutely central, the Inca. Um, it's some of the most diverse, the Andes Mountains, is some of the di most diverse and diversified terrain um, in the entire world, okay? And it's sort of diversified according to elevation. So on the coasts, um, you have deserts, okay? Two to 300 meters above <clears throat> sea level, you, you, you get warmer zones, okay? Which is good for um, producing certain crops, okay? A little higher than that, you get grasslands, okay? Which is good for raising livestock. Um, 3,000 meters above sea level, um, you get areas where you, it, it, where you can grow potatoes, root vegetables, uh, things like this. Um, and, the, it, and also the, at this area, you have a, quite a bit of wildlife. Okay. And then up on the peaks, it's of course cold and inhospitable. And then as you go back down the mountains, <clears throat> you find rainforests. Okay. So you have a very, very diverse climate, ecological climate, and environmental terrain <clears throat> in the Aztec Empire. Okay, so what does this mean politically? Well, it means that you really can't have a huge state, okay, until the Inca come along. But you basically have small kingdoms, okay, small chiefdoms is what is what the historians tend to call. You have a, a group of a diverse and small chief zones, people living very, very different lifestyles. <clears throat> very different life, lifestyles, some based on farming, some based on hunting, uh, some based on livestock. Uh, some people have extremely valuable territory, you know, particularly where there was, where was wildlife and you could grow root vegetables. It's a particularly desirable piece of land these, in, in, for these chiefdoms. Um, but you also, but it also means um, that the international system is very is quite fragmented there before the Inca. Okay, it's 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 quite a fragmented international system. All right, um, much of the many of the sources talk about um, how fractured the land was because of uh, predatory warfare. Um, you know, you have people stealing like, groups stealing livestock, things like this. Uh, you know, small petty kind of warfare. Um, alliances develop, but they quickly break. Um, Different religious beliefs, beliefs uh, it, it, according to uh, which city state you're from, uh, which chiefdom you're from, different gods, um, a number of small states competing for power. Okay, so it's a very sort of, I guess you could say, anarchic um, system of chiefdoms. Okay, if you want to, if you want to use a classic international relations term to describe it. Okay, so this. Um, but in a way, this fragmentation it was this fragmentation that allowed the Inca to kind of uh, consolidate the area quite quickly. Okay, in a sense, it was kind of a power vacuum, and it was kind of ripe for the taking. Okay, so the Inca, in essence, um, they're able to overpower these smaller chiefdoms um, with conquest, diplomacy, and even sort of inspiring awe in some of these groups. And it's in, in that way that they're able to kind of take over the entire Andes region. And this begins um, to happen, you know, in earnest. In, it, it, the date is uh, 1438, what um, historians place upon it, 1438. Um, so um, the Inca are in Cusco by this time, um, and they rep repel an invasion from the Chanca people, okay, who had, before the Inca rose, been the more powerful uh, state in, in, in the Andes region. Okay, so by sending these uh, the, the Chanka out, um, that kind of establishes um, the Inca as the dominant state. And from there, they kind of run with it. Okay, they have a series of Sapa Inca, which is the term used for their ruler. They have a series of, of, of Sapa Inca who basically continue to, 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 ex to, to, to push the bounds of, of, of Cusco and the Inca Empire. So that in a very quick period of time, you know, you're talking about 100 years, that they're able to, 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 to foster one of the biggest empires um, 
in South American history. All right. So again, um, it's 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 kind of difficult to discern which Inca emperor or which, which Sapa Inca was the one who did the conquering. Um, and again, because there was such a cult of worship around the Sapa Inca and the kinship groups, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but because there was such a cult of worship, it was, you get, you get sources that are, are conflicting and that one kinship group will say they were, their, their, um, kin was responsible for the expansion while others will say their kin was responsible for the expansion. So it becomes very muddled in terms of which Inca was actually sort of the, 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 the most successful empire builder of all the, of all the emperor rulers. Okay. But it seems, it seems fairly clear that it was Inca Roca, um, who began uh, the first series of expansion. Okay. Um, he, he is credited in most sources with conquering uh, much of central Peru and the areas to the west of Cusco. Um, but again, there's speculations that is that it might've just been to the west of Cusco and that his, his, his expansion was not quite um, as good as some sources say it is. Um, the most celebrated rulers, according to most texts, are Pacachuti and his son, uh, Tupac Inca Yupanqui. Yupanqui. Um, again, forgive the pronunciation. Um, um, but you know, it's it's it's, you, it's these two figures that are are largely credited with most of the expansion. Okay, the, um, they're began with Erica, began conquering in the rainforest, um, and it's 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 with these rulers that you kind of get the stories of uh, chiefdoms simply surrendering uh, because of the awe that the Inca inspired in people. Okay, so there's one there's there's a few stories of uh, them uh, launching a military campaign in the rainforest, uh, and there was a big chasm, and they needed to construct a bridge. So the military constructed a bridge to get over this big, this uh, this big gulf. Um, and the people on the other side, the other chief, the chieftain on the other side, was so impressed by their ability to make this bridge, they simply surrendered. Okay, and also stories of when they returned to Cusco along the road, uh, the chieftains along the road just simply uh, submit. Because of the sheer uh, obvious power of the Inca army, okay. lots of stories like that, especially during their during their reign. Okay, so it was kind of in this way, you know, a mix of uh, a mix of military uh, military conquering and, and, and just surrender, uh, diplomatic diplomatically savvy moves that the um, Inca sort of expand. Okay, now how do they govern such a large world, and how do they govern over such a diverse area? environmental area, okay? Um, indeed, it's probably their greatest achievement that they were able to hold this world together the way that they were. And make no mistake about it, it was not a loosely connected empire. The Spanish were absolutely amazed uh, with, the, um, with the level of control that the Inca had over, the, over this world. Um, so this was not a, a loosely held together empire by any means. So, the foundation of, of, the, of the Inca world was kinship. Okay, here we go again with this theme of kinship, right? I'm always talking about kinship. In Cuzco, which was, you know, the heart of the Inca world, um, you have a government that's structured according to royal kinship lines, okay? So, there's several royal kinship groups, where all Sapa Incas are chosen from, okay? And the Sapa Inca is the most powerful figure in Cusco, in, in, the, in, in the empire, but the kinship groups, his kinship groups and the surrounding kinship groups that had that previously had Sapa Incas from, uh, drawn from, are also tremendously powerful in Cusco and, and, and beyond, okay? So you have that this is the sort of core group of families that's, that's, that's kind of ruling who's in the, in the wider empire, all right? So in, in, in the empire, people from the, uh, the, the kinship group 
were often appointed to run distant provinces. So again, you have this notion of kinship, but we'll talk about that more a little bit later. You have two lines, okay? You have two groups of two groups of kinship groups. Higher Cusco, okay, and this is where the Sapa Inca comes from. All right. The Sapa Inca, the, the, the Sapa Inca after the death of one Sapa Inca was always chosen from one of someone from higher Cusco. You have lower Cusco, or upper and lower Cusco, whichever you prefer. Lower Cusco, interestingly enough, um, was where the Sapa Inca was chosen from, but, but this was changed by Inca Roca, okay? And from, from the days of Inca Roca onwards, the high priest is typically chosen <clears throat> from lower Cusco. All right, so that was, uh, that was a, a kind of shift that occurred during Inca Roca's time, okay, and sort of appeases both, both, both houses of Cusco in that sense. All right, now the structure, much like the Aztec, you're again dealing with a, a very hierarchical society, very hierarchical. Um, you have the Sapa Inca on top, which I mentioned, um, but his, he, this is an all-powerful figure, okay, thought to be, you know, related to the gods, this, this kind of thing. They rule for life, okay, they control military, they control the state, they control religion, um, they oversee feasts and ceremonies, things like this. They're, they're important even in death, okay, so the... the, the once, when they died, they'd be mummified and they'd be taken to public ceremonies, okay? And people would sort of take care of them, this kind of thing, okay? So, you know, you're talking about a sort of higher-than-life figure with the Sabbath Inca. Um, the high priest is kind of second in command, if you want to think of it like that. Um, he's the religious head of, in, the, in the Inca Empire. Um, and he's, his power was drawn from his ability to choose the next Sabbath Inca. He usually chose the next Sabbath Inca. Um, and he's also head of the Temple of the Sun. And sometimes he's involved in military uh, campaigns and things like this. Okay. Below them, below the, the, the Saba Inca and the high priest, you have aristocratic classes. Okay. Um, and these could, sometimes these were people who were in Cusco before the Inca arrived. Um, also, they were distant relations of the Sapa Inca. So this is your, 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 your aristocracy in Cusco. And finally, you have your commoners, okay, if, 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 you, if you don't mind the term, which makes up about 98% of the population. All right, so the vast majority of, uh, of people in the, in the Inca Empire were commoners. Laborers, farmers, things like, farmers, things like this. Okay. The empire itself, okay, that was Cusco. So the empire itself, it kind of mirrors this structure in a sense. Okay, you have four parts of the Inca world. All right, each part was headed by a great lord. Okay, Apu. So, the who was typically a relative of the Sapa Inca in some way. Okay, and he kind of takes care of all the administrative affairs of the England of, of the of the area. Um, and importantly, he sort of reports back what was going what's going on to the Sapa Inca. You know, if there's any problems, things like that. Below the great lord were provincial governors. Um, and these were typically from the aristocratic households of Cusco. All right, so it's kind of, you know, maybe distant kin, kin relations of the Sapa Inca, things like this, um, who, are, who are sent to, um, sent to the provinces to govern. Um, they, critically, they, from, the, from this level, uh, local people start to get involved. Okay, the Inca were very good at bringing uh, people from other areas and from other traditions into their traditions and assimilating them and adopting what um, what the other cultures believed in. So this, in a sense, gives legitimacy to uh, the Inca rule. So they would help the administrators by conducting the census, um, you know, making sure that there was enough farming going on, that there was enough food being ordered. Um, you know, things like this. They would make sure that everything uh, was running smoothly and up the line it would go back to the Sapa Inca. Okay. These, these provinces um, were kind of vital to the empire. Um, they were, you know, not sort of just territories that were conquered. They were expected to contribute food, labor, these kinds of things in a, in a in sort of vast imperial system. Okay, so like Part of the land, uh, part of the land in the provinces was dedicated to personal use. Uh, part of the land was dedicated to 
uh, use for the empire, things like this. So you know the, these 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 areas of the world are very very well um, uh, connected into uh, into a, a wider Inca Inca world. Okay, so it's not a sort of dissociated um, piece of land. All right. Now, how did they hold everything together besides government? Okay. Well, roads is the simple answer. Um, roads were tremendously important in the Inca world, um, especially considering the diverse terrain. Um, there were some 40,000 kilometers of road in the Inca Empire. You have way stations, suspension bridges, tunnels, huts, um, and the passage is in the... I'm not sure if I had to read that passage, but there's several passages of awe in the reading um, of, of, you know, Europeans awestruck by, by the, 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 uh, the, by the quality of the roads in such difficult terrain. Um, and importantly, the roads, um, have relay stations, okay? And this is how the Incas communicate, the Inca communicated across the empire, okay? So we talked about the head of the provincial, head of the provinces communicating with the Sapa Inca. This is how they did it, through roads, okay? So you have relay stations, and they're at, basically, they're at, like, 20, uh, kilometer intervals, um, throughout the empire, and you have some 2,000 spread out through the empire. And you have relay runners who run from one hut to the next hut, and then another runner takes over. And what they do is they bring a message. Uh, sometimes it was just an oral message. Uh, other times it was like a, a color-coded stick, something like this, um, which had meaning. Um, and they would basically run from point A to point B. Um, it, it's thought that they were able to cover 250 kilometers a day uh, through this method. Um, so it would take, and they estimate, so based on that logic, they estimate that it took about a week to deliver a message from the northern capital in the provinces to Cusco. Okay. So it was a very efficient way of transporting messages. Even small goods uh, were sometimes transported along those, along those roads. Traders worked along the roads, the, the, along those roads again, but again, uh, or, or not again, but to speak about economics, bringing up traders, um, the economic system of the Inca was vastly different than that of the uh, of the Aztec. Uh, you know, the Aztec was kind of a shopper's paradise in a sense. Um, the Inca, in the Inca world, some people call it kind of a socialist paradise. Uh, there were the, the government basically controlled all uh, surplus, and surplus was basically food. Um, so there's no real uh, commercial economy to speak of. There were some luxury goods, feathers, uh, cocoa leaves, gold, guano, things like that. Um, but really for the, for, the, for the everyday person, there was basically um, only small scale trade between, uh, between um, you know, local people, you know, maybe things they made, things like this. Instead, the central government controlled the distribution of food and the distribution of resources. So the, 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 the local uh, government leaders would say, you know, we need X amount of food, or we've produced X amount of food, and then the central government would make sure that they have that, okay? Because you have such different terrain, you have all different stuff, types of stuff being produced in the Inca Empire, right, food-wise. You know, so you had, to re you had to distribute this all over the place so that everybody's kind of getting an equal share. And this is what the government did. And this is one of the reasons that the government was so successful in holding it together, because it was a kind of a paternalistic thing uh, where they are uh, they take care of the people. Okay. You've got to be careful to, to, to say that, to give the impression that the Inca world was some sort of a paradise. I mean, uh, chieftains were trying to break off all the time, of course. Nobody likes to be ruled. But nonetheless, um, there was that kind of socialist type system in place of the Inca Empire. Um, so, um, that kind of uh, wraps up what I want to say about the Inca. Okay? Um, but again, speaking of, of wider themes um, that we've come across in these two lectures, I, mean, I think what jumps out here is the environment. Okay, In Africa, we saw there was a huge uh, difference between... Um, there was a huge difference between... Um, the states in the hinterland, you know, and, and inland, and the states on the coast, dictated by uh, 
psychological conditions. And now again, uh, with the uh, Aztec and Inca, particularly with the Inca, um, you see you know difficult terrain meant for kind of a fractured international system until the Inca were able to come along and kind of conquer that environment. Okay, uh, and you know one of the reasons why the Aztecs was so it was so tight knit from the get go um, was because it was you know all in the Valley of Mexico, very similar ecological conditions, which permit states to be roughly the same. Okay, so that's something to think about going forward. Now. Um, I don't have too much time left, but I do want to talk just a little bit about sacrifice. Because you can't talk about the Aztec and Incas without talking about um, human sacrifice. Um, beginning with the Mexica, the Aztec. Uh, one thing, the thing, one important thing to understand about the Mexica and the Aztec is that sacrifice made uh, the Aztec world, okay, according to their beliefs. All right, so um, there's several creation stories in the Aztec world, but one of the prominent ones uh, says that in order to create the fifth sun, which the Aztec believed they lived in, the fifth sun, this period, um, the uh, uh, gods basically the gods basically had to throw themselves into fire to make sure that the world was stable enough. Okay, so you have this 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 story of origin where all these gods are killing themselves, right? So it was supposed to be one god in the first place, but that didn't do it. So more and more gods start to jump into the fire. And the only god that lives is the, the wind, the god of wind, okay? And he sort of blows life into, into the world, as it were. Okay, so you have a very violent and sacrificial beginning of the Aztec world. And this was central to the Aztec, Aztec belief system, okay? So... You have all kinds of sacrifice that occurs in the Aztec Empire, of course, because their world is based in it, right? was based upon it. So you have kind of auto-sacrifice going on quite regularly. So priests uh, kind of pierce their earlobes or their cheeks or uh, things like that um, daily. Okay? And, and, and people would do it during, during uh, ceremonies as well. Okay? Um, but the real way to kind of atone with for Simmons was human sacrifice. Okay, and so human sacrifices were often usually held monthly. Okay, um, victims tended to be chosen about a year in advance. Okay, and there was a long preparation process to get the uh, get the victim ready. Okay, and it's kind of everything that you might have might have heard actually. Okay, they're trained in all sorts of things. They're, they're first of all they're picked because they're supposed to be flawless. Okay, so you get this really handsome, strapping young man off the battlefield as a prisoner of war, and then you train him, then they trained him, the priest would train him, uh, teach him to play the flute, uh, teach him to basically behave like a god, um, public speaking, um, and certain religious practices, okay, because at the moment of sacrifice, he's supposed to be this god, right, so he has to act godlike. Um, you know, a few days before, um, the sacrifice is about to take place. They they have a great old time. You know they're paraded through the streets. They have tons of women falling all over them. Uh, these kinds of things. And then it's time for the sacrifice. Okay, and the sacrifice would take place at the top of a pyramid. I'm sure everybody's seen images of an Aztec period. Now every Aztec city state had one of these periods to conduct a sacrifice on. Um, and the victim is taken up to the top of the pyramid. He's laid out. And his hands stretched out. His feet stretched out. Um, and the priest basically uh, cuts his heart out um, with a knife and kind of discards the heart and would draw the person down the stairs. Okay, and that's kind of how sacrifice worked in the Aztec world. Uh, every 52 years, there was a, uh, a, a special new fire ceremony. Um, the Aztec believed that every, that every that at some point in a 52 year cycle, their world would end. The fifth sun was very unstable, so at some point in a 52 year your cycle, the world will end. So they conduct a huge ceremony every 52 years where everyone um, in the Aztec world uh, puts out their fires. Um, and on the main temple, um, the priest would uh, go up with the sacrificial victim, uh, cut the heart out, light a fire on the chest. And the hope would be that that would save the Aztec world. And of course, um, it usually did. Um, and finally, to talk about the Inca. Um, the, the sacrifice in the Inca world was quite different, and it was a rather 
kind of disturbing um, tradition of child sacrifice. You kind of prefer to sacrifice children. Um, and most of it seemed to be linked to glorifying the Sapa Inca himself. Um, children were selected because of purity. Okay? Um, so upon um, you know, the installation of a new Sapa Inca, uh, 200 children were sacrificed across the Inca world. Um, they were dead. It was the, the sacrifice was dedicated to the Creator God, God and the purpose was to uh, have uh, to ensure long life for the Sapa Inca, um, to have a peaceful rule, to have a successful rule, and somewhat ironically, to have many children. Again, when the Sapa Inca would, would died, okay, um, there were more sacrifices. Both children and, and llamas. Llamas were sacrificed. A thousand llamas were burned in various parts of the empire where um, the Sapa Inca visited during his lifetime. Okay, and a thousand children were buried with the Inca, and they were thought to sort of be uh, to serve as servants for the afterlife okay? for the for the Inca. All right. So that kind of brings a uh, to a conclusion um, everything I wanted to introduce about the Aztec and Inca worlds. Um, so I will now um, leave you to a discussion um, with Eric. Uh, as I said, if there's any questions you have, you can email me directly, uh, particularly about like a, a paper topic, things like that. Please feel free. Um, otherwise, uh, I will see you on Sunday for a chat session. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the two lectures and I will see you soon.